This video is on using breadboards to prototype circuits. It corresponds to section 8.6 of Applied Analog Electronics. Now, breadboard is a very handy device for making temporary connections, for putting a circuit together just to test things out. It's not used for permanent circuits because it's very easy to undo the circuitry in a breadboard also. So it's great for testing things, terrible for making a permanent device. There are two different regions of the breadboard. The sort of central region here, which is where we'll do the components and wires for our circuit. And then on the edge, on each side, there are two long uh, parts, which if you look carefully are labeled with two colors, a blue and a red. The way the connections are done in a breadboard is that across each row here, the five holes are connected together. So there are five holes connected together on this side, five holes connected together on this side, but nothing crosses this divide in the middle. So each one of these rows gives me two sets of five connected holes. The long columns here on the outside are connected in the opposite direction. They're connected here vertically, whereas the rows are connected horizontally. The long wires here, the connections on the outside, are usually used for power and ground, which is why they're often going to be labeled plus and minus. So we'll use ground to the minus connection and power supply to the plus connection. If we're doing this from a something like the TCLC powering it, we just have a little short wire, red wire for the positive and black wire for the ground. If we're connecting it up to something like the Analog Discovery 2, where we've got um, wires that end, up, end with these female headers on the end, then what we'll do is we'll use some male header pins to connect to them. Here I've got two male header pins. I can put them in to the plus and minus there, and then we I could hook up if this was the Analog Discovery 2, I could hook up the connection just by slipping it onto the post there. And um, that's actually a very handy thing to do um, because the only thing you make good connections with on the uh, female headers are these sorts of male header posts. You never want to stick a bare wire into one of those female headers because if the bare wire breaks off, there's no way to get it out again. And basically that ruins the female header and one would have to cut it off and crimp on a new one, which is a, a lot of extra work. So the only thing that goes into these female headers is the male header pins. Okay, and when you're doing header pins like this to make connections, you sometimes want to use them for these oscilloscope uh, connections and other things. Try to avoid doing single pins like this because they're wobbly. Instead of doing that, Take two pins, and if you've got clumsy fingers like me, you're probably better off doing this with a pair of pliers, pushing them in both pins. And that gives me a little bit of wobble in this direction, but very little in the other direction. And that makes better connections. You're less likely to pull it out accidentally. Um, most of the time we'll just be doing wires directly into the breadboard. And uh, when you do that, you don't want to strip long pieces of wire like I've shown here. Because if you do that, s stick that, this is a new breadboard, so the connections here are fairly tight. There, got that stuck in there. Take another wire right next to it, stick it in, and if you look at what's happening here, I've got a lot of bare wire exposed, and it's really easy for those to accidentally touch and short. You never want to have bare wire exposed on the breadboard, so that is way too much stripping. The amount that you should have is about three millimeters, so that when you push it in, it goes all the way down so the insulation touches the board, and there's no bare wire exposed. And 
Now, I have two different sizes of wire here, and you notice the green wire was much harder for me to get in than the white wire. The green wire is 22 gauge wire. The white wire is 24 gauge wire. Now, theoretically, both these gauges work with breadboards. The problem is the 24 gauge is often a little loose. And if you've got loose connections, it can be very hard to debug your circuit because you think you're making a good connection and sometimes you're not. So I recommend using 22 gauge wires. It's a little harder to push in, but it's held much more firmly while it's in. And so the wires that we provide for the class are all 22 gauge rather than 24 gauge. So no 24 gauge, use the 22 gauge. And you notice the numbers there are a little confusing. The larger number is a finer wire. It's basically how many, in the old days, it was how many dies it had been pulled through. And so each additional die stretched the wire finer. And so 24 gauge is finer than 22 gauge. So 22 gauge is what you want to use. Okay, so wires, fairly easy to put in. Um, if you're trying to do point to point connection on the board, say I want to connect from there over to here. Notice that the wire has gone in essentially all the way so I don't have bare wire exposed and the wire is sitting close to the board. It's not looping way up making these huge ungainly loops um, because those are very easy to accidentally pull out. Keep your wires close to the board. It'll make it much neater. You won't have tangled wires, um, and it, so it'll be easy to f f see where they go to, and it'll also make it much harder to knock it out of the board accidentally. When you're doing the ground and power connections, use short wires. So I'm going from the ground line over to there. And I don't have, again, a large loop here that uh, breaks easily. And if I've got power connection, same sort of deal. And again, if you've got clumsy fingers like mine, it is sometimes easier to use uh, long nose pliers, needle nose pliers like these, to insert The wires where you need them. Okay, so that's the sort of uh, connection we've got. Now, when I put this red wire in here, these other four holes of that row are now connected to this long wire here, here that runs along the outside. And so those would all be at 3.3 volts if I remember to hook up the power to 3.3 volts there. And the ground one here connects to these four holes in this row. The holes on this side, none of them are connected. If I need to put in a resistor, okay, there's two ways I can do that. One of them is what I refer to as the flying resistor, where I've bent one of the leads around to come down next to the other one. I can then put those two wires in into adjacent rows. And what I have is that the resistor comes from one hole, goes up, goes around the other. This flying resistor design gives you very compact layouts in that you have two immediately adjacent holes here being used. The problem is it's easy to accidentally knock this thing around. So um, if you're doing something where you're not having to transport the, the breadboard, the flying resistor can make things very compact. It's particularly nice later on when we do op-amp circuits because we often have to connect a resistor between two pins of the op-amp that are just a tenth of an inch apart here. Another way to do it, if you have connection that you want to have flat against the board the way you did the resistors, is to take the resistor and bend it to the length you want to go, the number of holes you want to connect. And here I have a handy little tool that gets it multiples of a tenth of an inch. Um, and then trim the leads down so they're like the wire, not too long. And then you can put in the resistor 
between a pair of holes, if I get them lined up right. And it's not sticking very far out of the printed circuit board. So it doesn't get knocked as easily. In fact, I could have cut those leads a little bit shorter. And you can see that the wire here goes into row 40, which is the same row that this yellow wire is in. So this yellow wire connects this pin that's in row 30 to row 40. And then there's a resistor that goes down to row 45. And uh, when you're doing capacitors, same sort of deal. If I wanted a resistor and capacitor in series, I can stick the capacitor in connecting the next row here. Um, one thing that a lot of students make mistakes on is that they try to put in components horizontally. That capacitor isn't doing a thing because its two ends are short-circuited. They're both connected to the same row. Everything on that row is connected together inside the breadboard. So that capacitor isn't doing anything. It's just short-circuited. Your components must always be running from one row to another row. Now, there is one exception to that, and that is if you cross this chasm here in the middle, okay, and that capacitor wires are too close together to do it, I can, if I cross the chasm like that, the row on this side and the row on that side are different connections. So here I've got row 49, row 49, but One's row 49 left, the other is row 49 right. They're not short-circuited. So that's two different things being connected. Okay, so those are the probably the most important things is strip your wires the right amount. Don't make bare wires stick out that can cause short circuits. Um, but do have enough wires that you can basically get the depth of the breadboard. Okay, that's a, a good stripping guide. If the wire is too short, then it might not make contact. You put it in, you hit the insulation before, before the wire makes contact. If it's too long, you risk short-circuiting wires together. Run your wires point-to-point -point close to the board. Um, if you need to connect up to a female header, such as we will have on the Analog Discovery 2, always do that with a double-headed pin and do the double-headed pins in twos or threes, not singletons, to avoid them being too wobbly. Um, resistors can be put in either flush to the board or what I call a flying resistor configuration where it's two adjacent holes. And again, that's probably would be better if I trimmed those leads down a bit so that when you put the resistor in for the two holes, the body of the resistor comes down to the breadboard and then it's not as likely to get knocked out. And you also don't have any bare wire underneath there showing. There's bare wire on the side on the other side, so the bare wire on this side is pretty much unavoidable, but you don't want bare wire immediately next to it on the other side. Okay. Um, that's about all you probably need to know about breadboards for now. We will talk more when we do more complicated circuits later on about color coding of wires and stuff to make circuits easier to debug, but that can be saved for another video.